Uh, welcome, everyone. It's good to have you here. Uh, I see some familiar faces and some less familiar faces. Uh, so that's, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, so what I wanted to do is uh, prepare to talk. And within the talk, I have some images, uh, a few videos to, to look at. And there's also an uh, audience participation component, because that's just how I roll. We have to uh, practice what we're up to. So uh, this segment, this talk, is one that is looking at pedagogy as um, not simply pedagogical strategies in general, but to look more at the ways that I translate this idea of pedagogy through uh, lenses or filters of disruption or, or criticality. And uh, so part of the work that I do uh, professionally is prepare teachers of art for K-12. But I also work with graduate students uh, to be, uh, as they uh, conduct their research. Uh, and I also do my, my own research um, in, in scholarly kinds of moves about the, the ways in which visual imagery, uh, visual art, visual cultural production functions uh, as, as modes or, or spaces um, uh, for teaching and learning. Uh, Jasper Johns, a uh, pop artist, uh, or someone who's been relegated into that space by some critics and historians. Um, this is something, this is a statement he made about his art practice. Like, how do you make your art? What's your approach? Well, I take an object, do something to it, and I do something else to it. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, that seems really simplified. But for me, that's really interesting and quite powerful um, uh, methodology or method to use. You, know, you take something and then that thing is not just, um, it's not finished. It's not done being whatever it could be and then do something to it. Okay, well I did, but then let's keep it going, do something else to it. So for me the doing can happen in a number of ways. You can alter it, you can modify it, you can throw it, you can add something to it, you can take something away. But we can also as viewers um, or uh, people who are engaging with that object, we might ask questions. So asking, the asking of questions is a form of doing. And so for me, John's quotation is, is nice is for me as a bridge from a more modernist uh, mindset or approach where it's about the object and it's about the making and the process of making to uh, some folks might talk about the slide into postmodernism or other post spaces where uh, we move beyond objectness or materialness to um, uh, other realms that have more conceptual um, um, uh, content and, and interest. That notion of asking questions or taking an object, doing something to it, doing something else to it, you could engage learners like that. Right? That's one way to engage learners. So if we think about learners, we should also think about curriculum. Now this is an image, uh, this is not one that I drew, but it's a, a cartoon, for, uh, one, a single cartoon panel from non sequitur. And I use this image when I teach curriculum classes. So on the right we have this larger fish, with kind of sharp teeth and there's stuff falling down from the fish's mouth and then there are these three smaller fish and then there's a, uh, another fish that's kind of medium sized and that one actually knows how to talk which I think is an interesting thing. So we're able to know what fish say and the, large, the medium sized fish says, no we can't swim any faster. The school curriculum is geared for the slower swimmers. So the ten of you have to wait for the others to catch up. I don't know about you, I only see four other fish. I only see four other fish. I do see one fish that and little fish, looks like little fish bits that are falling from this larger fish's mouth. So where is the curriculum here? Is the curriculum this larger fish with the sharp teeth? Is the curriculum uh, the, the swimming? Is the curriculum the water itself? This cartoon allows us to have multiple entry points to ask where the curriculum uh, resides. And if we think about um, that word curriculum, it is derived from a Latin uh, word, carere, and that's the infinitive to run. So curriculum is to run. It's the running of a course rather than a noun. If we think about it in those terms, right? Um, some curriculum theorists um, did, did work in the 70s and 80s to reconceptualize curriculum but and focus on this idea of curriculum as a verb to run. So the running, or in this case the swimming of the course is the curriculum. So how they swim. So apparently these, the, I'm assuming the medium-sized fish is the teacher. Is that 
And could be, could also be the, you know, the school principal or whoever's in charge there. But the, the middle three are probably, or s supposed to be, maybe the students who seem to know how to swim the course the way that it was designed. Maybe, well, this could be one of the, the learners too, who's swimming adequately. But it, sometimes when I have um, use this with my students in, in curriculum courses, they talk about how this larger fish, they often call it the barracuda, say that's the curriculum. The curriculum eats up the swimmers who don't swim in predetermined ways. Oh, okay, so here curriculum is a noun and an adversarial thing. Well, how depressing is that to be a teacher or a learner to think the curriculum's after you, you better stay in front of it. But if we think of the curriculum as a verb in the ways in which we swim, so maybe some swimmers swim higher in the water, some swim lower, some swim sideways, some swim faster and slower. How might the curriculum allow for multiple swimmers rather than a, a predetermined and singular notion of what a learner could be? But that's if we, prefer, or that's if we privilege the idea of learning. Right? If we think about teaching, we can just deliver. I mean, uh, there are um, notions of, of, of teaching and curriculum that uh, from the early 1900s and late 1800s that would think, that would proclaim that t learners are empty vessels. And the teacher has all the knowledge. We just fill you up with knowledge. And that says, well, you're a learner. You don't bring anything to the classroom. But that's not the case. You swim the way you swim. Bring that to the classroom. So this idea of shifting from teaching to learning privileges or allows more attention to what learners bring to those spaces. Well, another a standardized approach that was very popular um, 100 years ago and still somehow is, is popular within uh, some circles in art, at teaching and education are the elements of art and the principles of design. Some people call them the elements and principles. Well, it's the elements of art and principles of design. And certainly these are ways to say, look, these are the things that are going on in visual imagery or, or, or material culture. But they weren't intended to be the limitations. They were intended to be ways to gain access to what we're seeing in front of us. Misinterpretation of that, um, quite often, uh, teachers, studio teachers, art teachers, other folks will think that these are the limits. And if we only talk about line, shape, color, texture, pattern, rhythm, then um, we've, we've covered the curriculum. We've taught what we need to teach. Well, that's an interesting approach if you want to avoid content, if you want, uh, if you want to avoid concepts and ideas and social issues, if you want to avoid um, uh, live, li lived experiences in the lives of, of, of other people. And certainly when you're looking at works of art that are representative of or reflections of lived experiences to omit interest in what we're seeing and what is being represented um, by simply limiting it to a formalist, and this is formalist notions, uh, um, then we're missing part of the, the conversation. So a number of years ago, uh, Olivia Goody, uh, who is a scholar at School of the Art Institute uh, in Chicago, she said, look, we're living in, a, we're not in this modernist notion, and, and there are different ways that we can mobilize uh, art practices. And she constructed this set of postmodern principles by looking at the work that her students were making uh, during uh, weekend uh, art classes in the spiral workshop. And she said, you know, those other uh, principles, the elements of art and principles of design, th those seven, group of seven elements and group of seven principles, were guiding and have done some, some work in art curriculum. But she said, as I look at the work my students are making based on the assignments that we're up to in the spiral curriculum that are focused on themes, focused on social issues, focused on concepts, focused on lived experiences. She said, of all of these works, these seven principles seem to emerge. Not that the elements of art and principles of design aren't there, because I would, I'd, I'd kind of dare you to point to something in the world that you can't talk about in terms of line, or shape, or texture. Right? So she's saying that from the, looking at the student's work, generated from a thematic approach about concepts and lived experiences in the world, in text and image is a postmodern principle. Hybridity, this idea of things kind of overlapping and, and, and molding, mer merging together, gazing the way in which one looks and the perspective from which one looks and how one is looked at. 
representing, not just to represent something, but how one's identity gets represented or how one represents oneself. Uh, appropriation borrowing from one context to another, juxtaposition, the critique of two objects or two images in relationship to each other. Recontextualization, similar to appropriation, but taking something out of one context, putting it in a new context, now it speaks differently about this other context, and layering this, this idea of, of how narratives or layers can be read through each other for multiple meanings. And I love what she says, which is also the pull-out quotation from this article. An infinite amount of time is wasted in misdirected effort because tradition has a strong hold, right? I mean, there are other things that we can be doing, but because we're regimented in tradition, we, we just can't get there. All right, so let's engage some learners like this. How about being some learners? Good? All right. I have, we have large paper. These are essentially jumbo-sized post-it notes. And we have markers. We have markers of different colors. Most of them are also gigantic size. It's like this larger cartoon version of post-it notes and little markers. And what I would like you to do is we're going to use this approach um, where uh, we're going to do, it's derived from think, pair, share. Right, this, this, this approach of, of learning, where I want you to think on your own, and then you're going to find someone else to pair with and, and con uh, connect with, and, and, and then you're going to share your ideas with each other, and then we'll, we'll share with the group. So what I'd like you to do uh, right now is, if you have something to write with, that's great. I don't think we brought any like normal size paper. Um, but uh, I'll give you two minutes to do this first part, to think on your own. What I would like you to do is choose one. I'm not going to decide for you, but I'd like you to choose on your own one of these tasks, or one of these statements, and I want you to come up with a list. So if you choose the first one, you're going to come up with a list of 10 important women in the history of the world. Don't show anybody. Keep it to yourself for now. Or you could choose the second one. You can make a list of 10 important events in the history of the world. Or you can make a list of 10 important human creations in the history of the world. Does this make sense? Two minutes, go for it, and then we'll come back together. The activity that we are doing is one that I use in a curriculum development class, and also curriculum theory class, usually near the beginning of the semester, to underscore this idea that uh, curriculum development, curriculum design, Curriculum as a general practice is a political act, and it's based in values, it's based in experiences. Imagine a textbook company approached you and says, oh, you could get this contract for a textbook, a history book. We only have enough money for 10 chapters. <laughs> so if you had 10 weeks to teach your course, what 10 topics would you teach? You got to decide what doesn't get taught. Deciding what is not in the curriculum is part of the political act, it's part of the decision making. So these three prompts are ones that I've used for years and years and years to do exactly what we did. You did it in like 15 minutes. I typically spend 15 minutes having the students generate the ideas, and then we spend 45 minutes critiquing and interpreting. We're not going to spend 45 minutes critiquing and interpreting, but I'll lead you through some of the things that I, I like to do. Which prompt was this one? Um, this is events. This one? Yeah. Creations. Creations. What was this one? Creations. Women. Creations. Now notice the prompts are, we'll talk about how I worded the prompts in a little bit. I find it interesting, this is just my, the way I'm reading with your lists. One, two, three, four of the five lists use numbers. My assumption is that the one entry next to the number one is the most important. Only because it's listed, I'm, that's, I'm just kind of culturally, right. you know, in that habit. When I see a one, I think of that being first. Usually first is most important. Unless you're David Letterman, you're reading your top ten list backwards. If you had a last minute email from the publisher, oh, we just got some more money. <laughs> we could add another chapter to your textbook but you got to tell us by the end of the business day today. Could you come up with your number 11? Right? Or, oh, I'm sorry, our budget has been slashed. We have to cut two chapters. Which two are the least important? 
These are questions that curriculum designers, curriculum developers make all the time. Teachers, how much time do we have in the semester or the school year to teach? Oh, we only got so far. We got to hurry up and rush because this is more important. And somebody else told us this was important, so we got to teach. Well, I'm not teaching that. That seems less important. I want to. These are political decisions. But what is in is only there because it wasn't left out. A critical pedagogy or a pedagogy that I like to enact and encourage my students to use is one that asks these kinds of questions. It's constantly in this frame of asking. Even when we have our list, even when we have our decision of what seems to be important. Well, why is this on the list? And where else does this allow us to go? And if we take Toni Morrison, what can we do with her work? Where does her work allow us to go? Following Jasper Johns. And then where does that allow us to go, right? Take Toni Morrison, not an object, but we can think in those ways, right? Take this entry, do something to it, do something else to it. The word most doesn't appear in any of those prompts. Did you pick up on that? Why do you think I didn't put the word most in there? Too much pressure. Too much pressure? <laughs> on me? I could do easily written. I'm fine with four letter words. I can just. Because so, too much pressure for whom? For, the, for us, for trying to, like, think, well, at least for me, that's how I would feel like most and most. Um, Even though I think we still sort of tried to do that, mm -hmm. it didn't feel, it felt like, okay, what are, what are 10 important events? You know, Okay. I mean, it's subjective. What's most right. important to me is probably not what's most important to you or her or whoever else sitting here. Okay. Most of mine got in the way of the, in the, way of the word important because if you don't have the most there, you think what is important maybe more quickly or then you would have the most. So it's kind of a pedagogical strategy to take some stress away, to allow entry, to remove some of the complications embedded in just working out the different values ahead of time anyway. I mean, certainly those are important conversations. That, not the stress. I don't like to do stress in students. But to make um, an activity or allow an activity to have en uh, points of entry for people where they feel like they can be part of that, that work is, is, is crucial. I also think yes. that now that all the lists are done, that because the word most is not there, this is not a final list. So I can look at somebody else's list and say, OK, that is also important as opposed to like a final list of the most important. So it allows for changing and after it's done out there. Absolutely. So it's not fixed. Absolutely. But that notion of curriculum for a lot of people, it's fixed. It's done. It's a noun. It's not a running. It's not a continuation. It's not a, a springboard and a prompt. You're exactly right. It's a, con it's a point of continuous learning. Yeah, good stuff. All right. So let's slide back up here. Wow, this is about 20 years ago. And I was working with hypertext software, story space. So you kind of see that map in the upper left. And my idea was, I go to the barber shop and I get my hair cut. But I learn a lot of stuff in that barber shop. I think this barber shop might be a curriculum. It might be an educational space. No. It's a hypertext. There's a bunch of moving parts and different relationships. Maybe it's all of those things. So I started to overlap those different thoughts into a piece called Pat's Barbershop. One day I asked the gathering of barbers and clients, what can someone learn in here? Meaning, what can someone learn in this barbershop? And this barbershop is in Norfolk, Virginia, predominantly African-American segment of uh, Norfolk. This was when I was um, on faculty at uh, Old Dominion University. So I asked Pat, the owner and lead barber, what can somebody learn in here? And according to Pat, people learn a lot about life, education, business, the street, the whole nine. Someone else noted with a smirk, they learn what a gram is. He was talking about um, illicit substances. How much you can get for a stolen TV. And that they can learn that crack is good. We love crackheads. What he meant was, the first part, he was actually being sarcastic. But the second part was, he was, um, uh, being more supportive. Um, in a matter of fact tone, one of the barbers commented, if you could put a camera in here for a week, you could make a movie. At one point, Pat himself responded to my question in a melodic chant, OJ did it, OJ did it, a reference to a scene in the movie Barbershop in the famous court trial. 
Later, in a more serious tone, Pat proudly stated, younger teenagers learn from me. Don't sell drugs, be successful, keep a straight head. Pat admitted that in his place, you learn about everyday life. And this project went on for years. Going in, and they'd call me professor. I'm like, hey, professor, guess what? This, and they would start to tell me what they learned recently, and so I'd get new lessons. And so this, this article is filled with different ways to think about that barbershop as a hypertext. Looking at other uh, uh, subsequent work, not only my artist in residence here at MIT this year, but I'm also an artist in residence at a local elementary school back where I live. I've been working with first graders and third graders. So you know what I did a few weeks ago? I talked to third graders about epidemiology, which is what you do, right? Showed them this map. My intention wasn't to talk specifically about epidemiology. My intention was to talk about how the visual representation of ideas, or how the visual representation of data, and the visual representation of information might allow us access to ways of knowing and understanding that we wouldn't have without those visual representations. So here we have a segment of London. And um, you see a bunch of dots there. And those dots essentially are the, the places where Jon Snow um, in the late 1800s uh, identified people who had died from cholera. And his theory, which was different than the local theory and, and the, the common theory at that point, um, his theory was people were getting cholera from, the wa from water. Everybody else says, no, it's in the air, or it's divine intervention, or something else is going on. John, you don't know what you're talking about. So I, sh I told the kids this, but I, I didn't tell them this yet. I said, here's a map. What do, you, what do you see? Oh, it's a map. OK. And then what else do you see? Well, I see a bunch of dots. What do you think those dots are? Well, hey, those are the people. That's where they live. Or maybe that's where something happened. Why are there more dots here, not other? I don't know. And they said, oh, wait, there's some X's. What do you think those X's are? And they had all these ideas. Well, you don't see the X's here, the X's. The X's are here. Oh, OK, that's helpful. Thanks. So what's going on? Tell me about the relationship between the x's and the dots. Oh, well, most of the dots are in the middle, and most of them are around that green dot in the center. I said, oh, you know what? That's what Jon Snow thought, too. Guess what he figured out? That's where the people were getting sick. That's where the people were dying, because they were drinking the water. And it was because he was able to visually represent the data, he could get to this, this observation. They thought that was pretty cool. Then I told him, so now here's a new word, epidemiology. <laughs> Bunch of eight, nine-year-olds saying epidemiology. It's great. But they start to understand how visual representation of information allows access to ideas in different ways. And I said, if you like this map, what about this one? Other people thought that that map was interesting too. How many different ways could you represent data visually using a map? Other people thought Jon Snow's idea was really cool. They came up, oh, and then as soon as I showed this, oh, that's Google Maps. Eight and nine-year-olds know about Google Maps? Yeah. Hmm. So now, how does Google Maps play into how we might teach in elementary school about space, about visual representation? Just taking an object and doing something to it and doing something else to it. I do something similar with my pre-service teachers as they're preparing to become teachers, or preparing to go out into classrooms to do their student teaching, when they're just trying to figure out how learning and teaching happens in educational spaces, one of the tasks I give them is, all right, go out and do your next observation. What I want you to do is when you sit down, I want you to draw a map of the classroom on a piece of paper and take with you a marker that you know will bleed if you leave it too long on the piece of paper. And what I want you to do is I want you to make a note of where all of the furniture is in the room Entry points, exit points. I want you to indicate where the students are when you enter the room and indicate where the teacher is by putting your marker down. And the entire time that you're there, you move your marker wherever the teacher moves. And when the teacher stops, you stop your marker. When the teacher starts moving, you move the marker. So if the, marker, if the teacher stops, the marker stops. If the marker stops, the marker starts to bleed. It starts to, over time, take up more and more space. And then I collect these maps and we look at them. We start talking about the relationship between where the teacher is in the room, where the learners are in the room, how the content is conveyed. We talk about what were the kids doing over here? If they're sitting over here, what were the kids doing? Because it looks like the teacher was over here most of the time. 
Were they talking? Were they engaged? Were they moving around the room? I'll show you some other maps. This person didn't use a marker, so they just kind of kept scribbling and overlapping. This is curious, isn't it? This teacher is either exhausted or on rollerblades or something. The teacher's all over the place, maybe not in a bad way. Certainly not giving a lecture like I'm doing right now. How do you know? Well, look at the map. Well, where was the teacher? The teacher was essentially everywhere, interacting with different students, moving to one station, moving to another station. The teacher filled that space physically. So I'm in the conversations about that would have to be generated later would be, so then what was happening among the learners too? What relationship does this teacher movement have to do with the ways in which students are learning? Whoa, look at that teacher. What might we learn about the practice of teaching and the practice of learning by visualizing movement? You could try to do it with all the students, but I don't know if you have enough fingers to move all the kids around, right? Interpretation, the construction of meaning or, or the uh, uh, attending to the construction of meanings uh, by talking about and making sense of works of art. Ooh, do you know about America Rock and Schoolhouse Rock? When I was a kid, these shows would come on Saturday morning cartoons between the television, between the, the cartoon. Two or three minute videos. Schoolhouse Rock and America Rock. America Rock was a way for us, was a way to, 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 to learn about the history of the United States or a history of the United States. So here you see some of the, the episodes. No More Kings, The Founding of America, Fireworks, The Declaration of Independence, The Preamble, The Constitution. I know the entire preamble because I watched Schoolhouse Rock. We the people in order for a more perfect union. The one at the top is from No More Kings. There's King George in the middle. <laughs> Ooh, Boston Tea Party. Is that big cup still here in the water? No? The one on the bottom, this is called Elbow Room. Elbow Room, Elbow Room. Got to, got to get me some Elbow Room. That's where I learned the word manifest destiny, or the term manifest destiny, schoolhouse rock. This is the melting pot shaped in the form of the United, continental United States. Little guy just jumps right in. It doesn't matter what your skin. Those are the lyrics. Rocking on a Roman's mission and inspection Over the horizon, what can it be? The pilgrims sailed the sea To find a place to call their own In their ship they flew Where they hoped to find a better home They finally knocked on Plymouth Rock And someone said, we're there No more kings. 
What a great place to live. I mean, the president does what the people want. Like, what else did you learn from that? I just learned that the president does what the people want. What else did you learn about this country based on, from the Schoolhouse Rock video? That we stand up for what we want, okay. fight for what we want. Okay, fight for what we want, stand up for what we want. What else did you learn? Pilgrims and the colonists didn't pay any attention to the people living there. Were there people living here in this video? There were three. What about what we didn't learn? Oh, what we didn't? Tell me something. All the things that we didn't learn that this video wildly misrepresented and, and erased a, a crucial part of history before and after. And even in the implications of freedom, it was freedom for white males. Um, but it paints a very nice, easy picture of what history was that is not true and it has repercussions now because of a false history. So. Well, I mean, they only had three minutes. I mean, you only had 10 slots. If you had 11 slots, that, you know, they only had three minutes. How can they put all that stuff in? I'm being. You know. So if you're. An art teacher, and let's say you're assigned to, or you're teaching interdisciplinary unit, or you're co working with the history teacher, you could justify showing this video. I mean, illustration, video, video production can be taught through the art classroom. The history teacher can pull the history, this history being taught. I could justify following a prescribed curriculum that says, History teacher and art teacher will work collaboratively to teach together. Yeah, okay, we're watching some Schoolhouse Rock. And we're going to interpret through remember those pedagogical lenses that, well, you were applying many of them in your reading. Right? And we were applying many of them in our reading of that list. So as an art teacher, or just a teacher who likes to cause trouble, or ask questions, or promote critical thinking, we could show these videos like this. Or you could show any visual culture example and interpret and critique through those different lenses. I just want to show you a couple of assignments. This assignment is by uh, another colleague, uh, Andres Hernandez, who teaches at School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And so this is a, a project that he engaged, asked his students to do, where he, he uses this quotation to talk about this and to question this term, informal sediment, settlements. Now you think about refugees, you think about people who've been displaced, and to think about the housing that they have constructed for themselves as informal, really? It's as formal as it's going to get for those folks in that moment. I mean, the terminology itself is problematic. And so he wants, he's thinking about these, you know, if you think about these kinds of places, it says, in fewer words, the city produced by the people. So inspired by the notion of a city produced by people, he, he tells the uh, students who are learning to be art teachers, and we have these open spaces at uh, Vermont College of Fine Arts, you're going to take one of the spaces and you're going to build a shelter out of cardboard, and it has to have, and there are certain criteria. You have to have a certain number of people in it. And by doing that at the bottom, you see the purpose of this assignment is, in, is that it's this intuitive building using limited materials and is focused on a one to one scale or the scale of real life. So, right there, because it's not a model, because it's scaled at real life, there's a way that our bodies enter into the reality and maybe into the reality of other people. It says, further purpose is to design. Uh, it, this design brief is a basic introduction of site specificity as well as full-scale prototyping and sketch modeling. And then at the end, you know, it can be, these models can be used to design to talk about principles of structure, enclosure, construction techniques. Right? So these are elements I would assume that are part of many other disciplines, architecture, urban planning, uh, and so forth. But the idea is that um, he's drawing from a quotation from a theoretical argument focusing on a term and saying this term is problematic, let's see what we might learn and how we might trouble this term through the act of making works of art. And then those works of art allow us to gain literally entry points into them, but also entry into the complications of what those terms mean. Here's another assignment Andres provides the students. Find a building and engage with the spaces and then document it through photography. 
So what do you learn about the spaces of, what do you learn about the physicality of a building by becoming part of that building, by becoming part of the, the negative spaces? You could write about it. You could measure it, tape measures. Or your body could try to fit in there and try to understand what that space is about. I know from teaching drawing, one technique we can do, if we put a chair or a series of chairs or still life in the middle of the room, we all had our drawing paper, we could start drawing what we see. Now we get us so far, but one strategy and our teacher will always do, or often do, is say, I want you to draw what's not there. I want you to draw the negative space. And when you draw the negative spaces between the chair, the spaces between the bars, and the spaces between the handles and the rungs, by drawing and rendering those negative spaces as accurately as possible, you render the positive spaces. So what do we learn by studying what is not there or the neglected spaces? We learn more about the presence of the dominant structure. So there are a number of books about pedagogy and about translating uh, art practice and, 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 and pedagogical uh, engagements in public spaces. Right? So I'll just conclude here for some questions. I can say, you know, you can engage learners like this. Or you could do boring stuff. <laughs> it's up to you. All right, thanks. <laughs>